Welcome to the Clifton Worley Show. This week we have Mark Johnston with us. What's up, man? Uh, not much. How you doing, man? I'm doing good. Um, I, th- I think a lot of our listeners probably know who you are, Mark, or at least follow you on Instagram. But uh, I uh, I met you um, out at Summer Now last week, and we ran each other at the uh, I believe it was the String Joy party. And yeah, yeah, and um, so we got to talking about what you do, and I thought it'd be really interesting to um, record an episode and kind of talk about uh, it, you. You do a very interesting thing, um, and kind of tell us a little bit about ambient no- notes and um, that's. But uh, I guess tell tell me tell us a little bit about yourself. And then um, maybe kind of talk about how you got into uh, doing what you're doing today. Sure, yeah. First of all, uh, you, you mentioned that Summer Nam was like a week ago. I think that you're right. And, dude, it feels <laughs> like so – Does it? doesn't it feel like a month ago? It does, yes. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I You said a week, and my mind just kind of went, wow, longest week ever. Um. Gosh, yeah, yeah. Post name. I mean, post name recovery is always a nightmare. You know how that is. Yes. But uh, yeah. So my backstory. That's a that's a big, uh, <laughs> ill-defined uh, question. So, I guess talking music and everything. I didn't really grow up on music. I didn't really grow up in a super musical household. Uh, my dad likes AM talk radio at low volumes, and uh, my mom like K Love. So uh, we kind of were raised on a very small amount of music and everything, but junior high uh, was right around the time that like music from my, from, for me, music piracy became like a thing where like Kaza and mm-hmm. share bear share and all the other ones kind of showed up and all of a sudden you just had access to music. And I kind of got into it through the, the new metal routes, which is a funny thing to start at considering kind of where I'm at at this point. But, uh, yeah, I started playing guitar in high school, um, kind of grew up doing sports and then took a hard left turn into music pretty much the moment I picked up a guitar. Uh, and yeah, I've just, I immediately fell in love with that. Uh, was a, was a bass player primarily for a few years and then, uh, just kind of found my way back over and it's just been, you know, downhill from there. <laughs> Yeah, that's that. Well, I don't think it's been downhill, but um, <laughs> <laughs> we uh, so, so circling back, uh, yeah, I know you're out in Sacramento. Is that where you grew up? Uh, yeah, more or less this area. Um, born in the Bay Area, lived in Chicago a little bit, but I've been in kind of the greater Sacramento area for gosh, what must be 26 years now. Okay, so what was you, you mentioned the new metal. Was that something that was going on in your region, or just something through the through the internet? You mentioned was that something you latched onto there? Yeah, I think. I mean, it, you know, early two thousands. It was it was pretty like zeitgeisty. Uh, bands like Linkin Park were kind of my first real like foray into going. Oh, I want to play guitar. That kind of thing. Um, but I think there's a lot of that attention towards that genre in Sacramento and at that age and at that time you don't understand kind of why your region might be different than somebody else's because you kind of only have your own Mm -hmm. but I mean you know hindsight being what it is now I can look back and go oh like we had the Deftones of course Sacramento had a new metal scene (laughs) yeah yeah well where did that where did that take you I mean um you're playing in some bands or yeah, I kind of, I, I played, I played a lot at, uh, at church when I was younger. Mm-hmm. And then I had a couple of bands that kind of got halfway off the ground and never quite went anywhere. Um, the new metal influence though, it, it's the kind of thing that causes your first guitar to be, you know, most people have that, like the, the candy apple red strat or the black and white strat as their first guitar. Uh, mine was like an, a Washburn X 11, like a, like a like a brown satin like cheap shredder guitar. Yeah. And uh yeah, and I thought that was like the greatest thing on the planet. Uh I don't think I owned anything with single coils for like my first four guitars, which is definitely a far cry from how I play now, but uh 
Yeah, yeah. The new metal thing was, I think I started playing bass because I wanted to get a Ibanez five string and slap bass like Korn did. <laughs> that's that's not a joke. I think I could play about half of the songs off their second record. Nice, nice. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking up this Washburn right now, and it kind of has that, I guess, the, that Jackson Charvel kind of look. Yeah, but with like a thicker body. It was like a, it was like the, it was like it was like a Paul Reed Smith for a man with no taste. <laughs> well, so what was what was what were you using to get your sound back then? Um, back I mean back then it was uh, at the very very start I think it was a Line Six Spider Two and a Washburn. So you can imagine <laughs> how good that must have sounded. Uh, and then I switched over to, uh, to using a pod XT live for just years and years and years. Um, I mostly switched guitars and not gear for the first probably decade of playing where I would just kind of, I was on like the harmony central forums and all that constantly gear swapping and just kind of bigger, the bigger, better trading for guitars. Um, like I had like Epiphone fire, like an Epiphone firebird couple of different sgs a couple different telecasters and just kind of always trying to figure out what wasn't working in my sound and not realizing that like the answer was going to be you know like a properly good amplifier or the fact that i really just needed a good modulated reverb yeah 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 well when you were playing bass where what were you doing there was that straight in oh yeah bass bass was always just kind of direct in maybe a sans amp maybe but some half the time it was just let let front of house compress and do like a high-end roll off and and call it a day yeah yeah well you had mentioned when um when i met you out out at um in in nashville that you kind of you were in a band at one point and you realized it was kind of phasing out and so you wanted to do something new. So tell us a little bit about that. Oh yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I was in, I was in kind of like a synth pop band here in Sacramento, uh, a few years back and probably the first band that I was a part of that kind of had any legs, so to speak. Uh, and we were playing, we were playing shows in the area, had a lot of, had kind of a lot of enthusiasm from people coming out to the shows and had pretty good numbers and it just was a really good, kind of expression like a good musical expression because at the time if i wasn't playing at a rehearsal or on stage i just really wasn't playing a whole lot and uh but as as bands go uh you can kind of start seeing the writing on the wall you can kind of start seeing the cracks forming and uh and i was able to call that shot probably seven or eight months ahead of time going this band is not going to to be around a whole lot longer and uh i gotta find some other outlet some other way to kind of just play music in front of people or just in a way that feels productive to me and so uh i had kind of found my i had found my way into kind of that boutique guitar gear world while that band was happening and so i just kind of leaned into the well, I don't know. I, I don't have anywhere to play right now, and I don't know how to make a record. So if I just kind of write minute long songs and put them on Instagram and make myself do it twice a week or whatever, it will force me to become better at recording and will put me in a position where I can start recording things that sound good and actually like work on my own op, like my own music and everything. Yeah. Well, you you had mentioned you kind of were jumping off into the be- boutique world. What was your foray into that? Uh, it was, I think at that point, hmm, it's a good question. I think at that point, my board was mostly walrus and old blood. Okay. Um, I think, I think I had, I think my first like boutique fuzz would have been the, uh, gosh, what's the, is it the violet world by Ren and Cuff? The, the purple one. Okay. Um, I had one of those, I think my first, like the first thing I ever saw, the first like kind of boutique pedal that ever caught my eye was the old blood uh black fountain and that was kind of the begin the beginning of the end for me like i have my black fountain the the original one i got up on the shelf right now that i can see and uh that thing's still phenomenal that thing is responsible for 
be way too many petals that surround it now. <laughs> well, that was a pretty big leap, in my opinion, with the old blood, um, old blood noise. Because when I think about like a boutique petal company, you know, that that really they kind of fit that that um, the whole thing, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Brady and those guys are just phenomenal. Dan and Seth and that whole team are just like, they've gotten, they started strong, like in, in a point, at a, at a point in the industry where like the spin chip, the FB1 based effects weren't super commonplace. They really kind of felt like a kind of early adopter of kind of pushing the boundaries of what that, that circuit can kind of do. And I mean, you look at what they what they're working on these days, and they have only grown and gotten weirder and more ambitious with it. And it's really exciting to see. Yeah, yeah, totally. Well, what was so you made this decision you were going to create this outlet on Instagram to um, kind of just create and be creative and throw out your music, get better at recording. Um, what what was your process to get to that point? Um, I guess it depends. Uh, one was, like I said, I just wanted a place I could play and I was getting really into all these new pieces of gear that I was getting, uh, and just kind of very enamored with the way that you could kind of pair them together and stack parts on top of each other. It all felt very novel and new to me at that point. Uh, so that was definitely a factor, but in terms of the way that I kind of positioned that stuff for the internet, I think it was driven by the fact that at the time I felt like I was looking for a lot of, uh, oh man, how to, how to phrase it. I think that, um, I think I can specifically remember I was looking for a demo of a small sound, big sound pedal, and I could not find a decent sounding demo. Mm -hmm. And as I, as I kind of started like widening my scope, I was realizing that like the vast majority of people using the gear that I wanted to see kind of how it sounded on the internet, we're all putting the same thing on the internet, which is they take this amazing pedal board and they, they write some huge, ambitious, creative, usually ambient kind of piece. And then all you see as the end user is them holding their cell phone and pointing it at a, at a ditto camera or at a ditto uh, looper. Yeah. And you're hearing cell phone audio and you're seeing just kind of like a video of just a looping pedal as it blinks every 32 seconds or whatever. And I remember just wanting to kind of like shake everybody and tell them like, you've got a $1,500 guitar, a $2,000 pedal board and a $900 amplifier. Sell one of your three transparent overdrives and buy a 57. <laughs> just kind of like, this is, this is the internet. This is social media where you're theoretical reach as an artist is infinite like you can theoretically be in front of as many people as exist under the right circumstances why wouldn't you put your best foot forward why wouldn't you try and and take your art and 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 present it as best you possibly can yeah and so i got i got i got very kind of old man get off my lawn about that and decided that i was gonna that everything i put online was gonna be like properly mixed properly multi-tracked and all that stuff even though i was using really cheap recording gear i just i wanted to make sure that i was taking that step yeah well tell us a little bit about kind of what you started off with your chain and kind of how that evolved to make this work yeah 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 i mean the funny thing about about me is uh I've always kind of accidentally owned really loud amplifiers. Um, <laughs> like one of the last amps that I had before I kind of really started knowing kind of what wattages that I needed, that kind of thing, was I had a Mesa Heartbreaker for about two years. And that amp is so unnecessary for anything I've ever done in my entire life. But, uh, but all that to say, when I started kind of home recording and all that, I knew I didn't really like the, the full featured modelers, like the Kempers and the Helices and all that stuff. Um, but I, I was in an apartment environment, so I couldn't record like full volume amps and stuff. And so like the different ways that I would record would be, uh, I, I went direct in very, very early and very, very quickly. Um, 
but for me in a in a world where like I didn't really do IRs because I tried to stay out of tweaking in my interface as much as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, I was just trying to figure out how to record direct in in a world where like the GFI Cabzus didn't exist yet and the Iconoclast didn't exist yet by New Neighbor. And all these like very commonplace direct in solutions are now so readily available. I was kind of just trying to figure out what the plan was. And I remember like my earliest recordings that were direct in being the old blood noise headphone amp on the left channel which in and of itself takes a whole bunch of janky additional steps to just kind of make work at a record level uh and then on the right side i was using a, a sans amp like a tech 21 sans amp but mm -hmm. this was for guitar so it's like a bass a bass di and a headphone amp as my left right and somehow like it sounded pretty good like we made it work but uh, it was, it's always been kind of like assembling the car as you drive it for me. Mm -hmm. uh, just trying to figure out how to kind of piece everything together at that point. And my direct in stuff at that point for being those kind of two fake DI amp setups were always really interesting because I was pushing it with like, uh, like a presser, like the diamond or the pulp and peel. And uh, usually like small sound, big sound mini, or, man, I can't even remember what other drives. I was I was probably never using a drive at that point. I was probably taking a flat signal, putting it through delay and reverb, and then just going direct in and just trying to EQ it into something usable in post. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, you were talking you were talking about your camera, and, and let me let me back up for a minute. I I, I was aware in, in our conversation that you your kind of your main gig is is a videographer, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's kind of my my day job and most of my freelance work. Okay, so you you already had a grasp then of you know the, the video side, obviously. Um, what uh, kind of what was your thought process there? Like, um, because you know, like you said, a lot of guys are taking their cell phones and doing this. Um, you're you're probably doing um, a better camera. Yeah, yeah, I am. Uh, part of the reason that I don't get all kind of get off my lawn status about video like I do with audio is because video being a part of what I do for a living already makes that a very easy like piece of what I do and how I present things. But I also kind of go, I, I, I do subscribe to the adage of kind of the best camera is the one you have. And as long as you can kind of like get a decent amount of light in your space, a your iPhone camera on a tripod will look just fine for for what you for what you need it for. As long as you're like you know shooting the right stuff, the right like as long as you're shooting the actual performance and not just the playback and all of those kind of things. So, but for me, I uh, having a background in video has been really really useful. I shoot everything on Sony's. Uh, my main camera is a Sony A7S Mark II with a uh, with a Zeiss 50 mil 1.4 lens on it, which will make sense to I'm assuming 0.2 percent of your listeners, uh, <laughs> considering that, this is a audio mirrorless? format about music. Yeah, yeah, okay. it's like the small little mirrorless ones. The A7 the A7S series is great because they're the ones that are also like really good in low light, which is great because my old apartments always had terrible lighting and I didn't use any actual like soft boxes or anything when I was recording at home. Uh, fortunately for me, uh, my wife and I's place now has like tons of natural light and it just, it just makes my job easier. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I imagine. I imagine. So, so you're, you're, what you're saying is that a, a good still shot of, and maybe are you running multi-camera or just one camera? How are you doing that? Um, in the early, early, early days, I was running two cameras, uh, but I just run one these days um, and I don't even move it. I just kind of set up, it's like frame the shot how I want it and then just do every single take in the same shot and then kind of edit and post. But uh, I'd like to get back to two camera mostly because I think that there's probably some merit in um, in being able to kind of showcase what the board looks like at the exact moment, especially as I'm doing more content with things like the infinity looper and the and the chase bliss mood 
and the kind of things where you want to know where where I'm catching like a sample and holding on to it and when I'm making kind of small adjustments on the board as opposed to just the guitar shot. So so you're running the camera shots and are you are you doing your audio like and I'm getting really geeked out and nerdy here so uh, No, let's I'm do sorry. it. I'm into it. <laughs> yeah. Are you are you doing your audio like in I'm I'm sure in post you're multi-tracking it and then you're mixing it and syncing that up with your video? Yeah, so the way the way that I've kind of kept the the recording rate or not the recording rate, the uh the editing time frames down so that it's not just because I've been I've been making two of these a week on average for the last like two and a half, three years or something like that. The way that I've been able to kind of keep from just killing myself in editing every week is uh I have a pretty straightforward workflow where I um Every single take of the song, like every new track, has to start from the beginning of the song. And if I and if the part's not going to come in until halfway through, I just let it dead roll for the first half. Uh, because in post, it means that I can. Oh, and then every single take has to be perfect, like in one take. Like I don't, I don't do any punch-ins or anything. I have to get the take right as an entire piece. Because in post, then I have all of these video clips where the start of the song happens at the same point and it's re- it becomes really easy to just stack all the video clips on top of each other over the at like final mix uh product mm-hmm. which is great because back in the day i used to do a little more kind of oh well this this guitar part doesn't come in until 115 so i'll just skip ahead to 105 and then trying to line up that video and post is just a nightmare so yeah it's yeah. just easier to do it the, the way i do it now yeah i can imagine can imagine that um it's it, well it's not like a music video that's like one stereo track you know <laughs> like you're yeah yeah it's a very complex well, the, thing the good thing is the good thing is that by the time everything's done it is just one stereo track i do all of my i do all of my mixing in logic i multi-track and i mix in logic and then i i send that bounce that 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 left right bounce to premiere where i do all my video editing so okay. fortunately by the time it hits video i'm already down to what is essentially music video production mm-hmm. okay okay well what has that journey cuz you know i'm always curious about when somebody's doing something especially on social media how how they you know, get going, but then how did, how does that grow? What does that start to take shape and look like? What has that been for you? Uh, it's been, it's been interesting. Um, like I said, it started purely as just an outlet as like a, I want a place where I can kind of put some music out there. Um, maybe grow a tiny little audience so that when I put out a record or something, there's somebody there on the other side, but there we go. Um, but I mean, in the three years or whatever, since then it's taken just such a strange shape where I did not expect to kind of grow the way that I had. I didn't expect to, I, I never even thought that like going to Nam would be like a part of my like Instagram presence or whatever. It's mm-hmm. such a strange funny thing to kind of have stuff like that translate into the real world and like i said it started as just these are some cool pedals they make some cool sounds i really am enjoying playing guitar more with this stuff than i have been for a while and it's kind of morphed into this uh this thing where i just go it's at this point it's about kind of the marathon it's about like i just i like challenging myself to not write the same thing twice to make the new video better than the one before it. And it's just been, it's kind of, it's kind of, it becomes self-motivating at a certain point, which I think is the only way you can keep something like, like this up for so long. But, uh, it's also just become a great, a great Avenue for connection. The more and more, as we get into the modern age, I become less convinced that the social internet is a net good for everybody. Mm -hmm. But, but I definitely feel like the subculture that we're in, the kind of weird, effecty 
guitar community thing is, is a bizarrely supportive and cool like environment. Like I've made really good friends uh, who are like really active guitar players, some who are kind of more enthusiasts and some who like own the companies and some who have nothing to do with it, just enjoy the music. But you end up like just kind of in a really cool space that you would not have been able to find in real life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can agree like in the podcast world. It's, that's been very much my experience too, is, is, is finding this unique corner uh, of the gear community and it's not as it's not really that large but um it's it's a really unique place and yeah 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 i've i've noticed that from being in like the various facebook groups and everything yeah um well you know your your instagram account um i mean it is really taken off what what was some of your i mean did it grow organically how did that how did that happen uh, yeah, it was it was very organic in in the sense that I never really engaged in any of the like follow for follow campaigns mm-hmm. or the like private your account, follow a bunch of people, then unfollow them once they follow you back. Like all the kind of games that you've seen people play and everything, I I attribute it to kind of a mix of the hustle, quote unquote. You know what I mean by that? Like just the just put out what you consider to be high quality content as often as you possibly can kind of thing, as well as trying to kind of optimize when you post and all that. And then I think a big factor there is like luck. Like, yeah, I've tried to kind of help guide friends of mine who are trying to grow pages where they, they ask questions about like the specifics of, of kind of how I grew and that kind of thing. And I can kind of look back and try to reverse engineer what I think caused it. And then they'll make content that looks like that and that I think is very good. And a lot of the times I go, okay, now you're doing all the stuff I did and you're a better musician than me. It should be working for you and it's not for some reason. So I think that a big part of this kind of thing is is the algorithm game and just kind of being in good favor with the like Instagram robots <laughs> at the right time. Yeah. And I think that it was a big factor for me. Like, there was a time like a year and a half ago or whatever where I was at like 6K or whatever. And and for some reason, there was just like pockets of time where for like a couple weeks at a time, every video I put up would get between like 16 and 40,000 views, which is so many more than I ever got that before then and so many more than I get these days as well. But there's just, there's these weird moments where I think you just, you're in the good graces of Instagram's like, click generating machine mm-hmm. and uh and i happened to kind of fall into one of those during a time where i had the the good fortune to be able to like hustle really hard and make a lot of content really often yeah yeah and I, I, a lot of people that i've talked to about instagram they they kind of have i think alluded to the same thing is like that algorithm like you 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 can kind of almost figure it out but not, not totally um, yeah, yeah. There was a time where I knew I, where I had it. I went, <laughs> I'm not kidding. I, I'm not kidding. I went, okay, if I post a video between three and 4 PM on a Tuesday and <laughs> it breaks and it breaks this number by 9 PM, I know that I'm going to get at least 200 followers over the next two days. Like I could map it out to a science at that point, And then something changed in the way that things were working and none of it worked anymore. Yeah. And, uh, and at this point, I, I can't be bothered to learn the new thing. Like, I'm I'm still on the same posting schedule I've been on for, gosh, a year now or something like that. Because at this point, I go, I, 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 I know the people I know. I have the connections I have. I'm making stuff I'm proud of. If people like it, they can show up. If they don't, that's fine too. I've I've mm-hmm. got I've got people who like it. Yeah, yeah. Well, kind of talk about that on the other side of that. The the people that support it the builders the what is that what has that been like for you that's probably been the most interesting the most kind of humbling aspect of this whole thing was i mean you know how it is this is this is not a cheap hobby to get into (laughs) uh especially once you once you take that that fateful step into the kind of boutique pedal world 
like music in general is an expensive hobby, but you can you can survive for, you know, 40 years or whatever on a good guitar and a good amp if that's the kind of thing you want. But the moment you take that step into the boutique pedal world, all of a sudden there's a new hotness every 37 minutes and all of them are between one uh, 199 and 350. And and as as I kind of started seeing the page grow, I kind of went well, maybe there's a way to at least subsidize the price of this hobby. There's a way to maybe, like, get, like, some artist do- artist endorsements or something. Something that would kind of help, kind of, you know, make it make it so it's not the kind of hobby that's going to prevent me from buying a house one day. And, uh, and things just kind of, like, steamrolled. And the thing that I've noticed is just... This 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 subculture, this kind of sub industry that we're in, feels very self selecting for like good people. Where you meet people in this industry, and if like if they own a company and they're kind of a jerk, they don't really last very long. Yeah. And you tend to see people who are really good dudes rise to the top. Like like uh, you've met you've met Joel from Chase Bliss. Yeah. He's maybe the nicest person I've ever met. Like he's. There's like nice people who are nice and then there's nice people who are nicer than they need to be. <laughs> and that's kind of how I describe him. My first, my first real Nam after kind of getting into this world, I kind of went there with no reason to be there. Just kind of going, I, I just want to go. I want to meet some people. I've talked to a couple of these people online and I'd like to just go put a face to the name and all of that. And, uh, and I went down to the Chase Bliss booth in the basement because I think this was 2016 Winter Nam. And uh, before I could even introduce myself to him, Joel came over and gave me a hug and made me feel super welcome. And was like, hey, it's so good to meet you. And, and to this day, he, he's like one of the most encouraging people I know in this industry. And getting to work with guys like him have just been such, a, such an amazing breath of fresh air considering the music industry in general, especially on the kind of musician side of it can tend to attract such ego monsters. Yeah. Yeah. I I agree. I think, I think this, this kind of, um, the boutique market's a very unique place. And I, I, I was in the Airbnb with some of the other podcasters and we were talking about like sometimes at now I'm like, you'll have these guys who fit that like stereotype typical like rock star musician attitude come in and it's like everybody's looking at them like they're 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 fish out of water you know they 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 don't know how to behave appropriately and you know they're asking for free stuff all around and they're being a jerk to everybody and like it's like the industry kind of weeds those people out yeah this 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 subsection of the industry definitely does and at the very least it does uh, on kind of the the kind of builder owner side of things, and I think probably in the demo side of things as well. Like, I have I've I've noticed that that Knobs and Ryan from Sixty Cycle and uh, all the dudes that I've met in kind of that world have all been like, once again, really good dudes. Kind of that same level of very kind and accommodating mm-hmm. as uh as as the builder side of it, and I go. There's always going to be the like artists who roll in and think they're the hotness and can do whatever they want, but but like you said, they feel very fish out of water, and I really like this because I I don't I don't like dealing with ego monster musicians. They're <laughs> they're they're not as important as they think they are. Yeah. Well, we we were I think I remember a brief conversation we had about those algorithms and and you know. All, <sighs> like it kind of changing the rules and like, um, you know, if like, for instance, Facebook, like it went down, a, I don't know, a month or so ago, like for a complete day. Where, oh yeah. This conversation. Yeah. And it, and it, and it was like, there's a lot of people who rely on, especially content cr- creators, you know, the Facebook yeah. and Instagram, um, platforms. And you know, what I think this like got to be a way where content creators can get to their reach or their audience without like the rules changing all the time. Man, I have, I, I, this is the kind of thing that worries me 
pretty often, uh, especially for somebody like me who just hasn't taken the time to really invest in like trying to migrate some of the audience over to YouTube or anywhere else. Like I'm even like with my own page and Instagram, we are so vastly Instagram dependent that Mm -hmm. if Instagram one day decides like, Hey, we're going to, we're going to stop focusing on music so much. We're going to start, we're going to start doing gifts. Gifts are going to be the new, the new like center point of the platform or whatever. It, it's the kind of thing that goes like, yeah, I go all of a sudden my audience doesn't exist anymore. And, and I honestly don't know what the answer to that is. Like we're very beholden to these platforms. Uh, even something that feels a little more democratic, like, like YouTube might, I guess, especially pitted against Instagram and Facebook, which are awful. Uh, you still are at the behest of whether or not the subscription page even wants to use, even wants to like include everyone's videos. And it is, it is kind of a weird thing to think about. Like none of us host, the, host our own websites. None of us, uh, have, have our, have, like are the, are the masters of our own destiny in terms of being able to talk to our audiences and, and, and it goes beyond just the content creators. It's, it's, the builders rely so heavily on this stuff as well. Like, no, you're right. It's, it's either it's either the it, the only other thing they really have is a newsletter, and the news the, and the email blasts are super useful for exactly that reason. But but if you're not a builder, you have no reason to have one of those email blasts. And that means if any of your primary platforms go away, the ability to whether it's making demos and reviews for companies or just in my case like or in my case for the vast majority of my time on the on the internet just making music for an audience just kind of going hey i hope you like it all of a sudden that just vanishes and there's no real recourse mhm yeah it, it 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 totally is and i mean even, even podcasters face um the difference in the different podcatchers and how people consume that content you know, it's oh, kind of I'm hard. So, I'm so sad with the, the direction <laughs> podcasting seems to be going right now. Yeah, it, it's like, um, well, even like, I think I was talking to Ryan Burke about this. When you sell, I mean, <laughs> when you um, when you post an episode, and let's say like Podbean is your host, okay, and yeah. you go to share it, like most of your audience is not going to listen to that Podbean link. Yeah, you have to get it yeah. on iTunes. Yeah, got to get it on iTunes. But then, like, even then, like, you know, not everybody's listening to it on Apple. You got people listening to it on all these different podcatchers. And um, you might, you know, YouTube seems to be the everyman's. You can maybe share, like, a YouTube link with it on there. But, like, you're not going to hit. It's like you're trying to advertise on all the platforms, yeah, it, it, it's 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 exhausting and it's a no win situation. Yeah. I I actually I actually have been dealing with this just recently because I know that Audible has their own self curated podcast. I know that Spotify has a mm-hmm. podcast library now, and uh, just I'm kind of uh, I have a I have a podcast that's debuting sometime in the next week, assuming Apple finally <laughs> reviews, which I'm sure you've dealt with this exact issue. Yes. I. I submitted I submitted our first three episodes last Monday and here we are the following Monday and it's still got that little orange dot next to it. And yeah, all the episodes are up on uh up on Podbean, but no one's gonna go to Podbean. Uh, so I'm not I'm not announcing until it's on iTunes because there's no point in announcing otherwise. Yeah. It's such a bummer and it's so it's 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 even more of a bummer and it's probably Apple's fault predominantly. Uh that once upon a time podcasts were just an RSS feed you could subscribe to. And now we are going down this route where within three years, there are going to be podcast networks that have like hardline paywalls and you have to use their proprietary app. Like it's one thing for podcasts to put like episodes older than 10 behind the paywall, but we're, we're going to get to a point where they're going to be app specific and it's going to be such a bummer. Yeah. Uh, the, yeah. I, I mean, I hope it doesn't get that tough. Um, but I, I definitely see what you're saying. And I've learned, I mean, I've learned like just playing around on Instagram, for instance, uh, with like this, you know, the Whirly Bird pedal is, it's kind of like a pay to play kind of deal. Like if you want it to extend your reach, you have to pay for the 
the IG ads. And they're not that much considering, you know, like Facebook ads. But it's it's a very kind of weird it's it, everything I guess and if there's any business sense about these organizations, everything is turning into um it less organic, more having to market so people can find your your content. Yeah, yeah. I uh I believe you and I not it's funny now that you've said that, I'm suddenly wondering to myself if if part of the reason that my like engagement is lower statistically than it was at a smaller number is because they're trying to push me into a like pay to promote pages or uh, post kind of thing. Oh, I'm sure of it. It's yeah. That's probably true and it's 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 really funny cuz I've never I think I've I think I've advertised one post ever on any social media platform and it was my last band and I was promoting a show we were doing. But outside of that, I don't think I've ever paid to promote a post and that that's so I, I it's funny i'm just i'm not a part of that that side of things so to me anytime i do anything goes viral or whatever it feels very organic because it statistic because it is empirically organic but but uh I, I i especially for what you're talking about kind of having a pedal that you're trying to get in front of people i could definitely see where that pressure starts to mount uh um, yeah of hey, you want people to see this, don't you? Well, you're gonna you're gonna pay to get it in front of people one way or the other. Yeah, yeah. It's it's more of a it's more of a marketing you know decision at that point rather than a it, than trying to be spammy. Which it's kind of like for me, you know, my background. It's like I don't you know, everything. All that seems so spammy and pushy, but like really if you have something and you want to share it like now like you have to push it hard like that or the pressure is yeah. there so that's kind yeah, of kind of the that. future of i think a lot of the companies um who are doing it on a way bigger level i think i think that uh cuz i'm i'm worried very similar to you in that sense of like it feels i don't like seeing ads on my instagram and mm-hmm. i feel very if, and i feel awkward about putting my content in front of somebody who didn't expressly sign up for it. Like I, I, I think I can count on one hand the amount of times I've posted one of my videos in a group or on a page that isn't one that I manage specifically. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I have that same kind of, uh, it just feels spammy and intrusive to put my content in front of somebody else. And I think there's just, there might be value in just going, Hey, if you made something and you're super excited about it, then like do what you need to do to get it in front of people. Do exactly. what you need to do. Cause, cause if you believe in it, you go, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not paying to put this in front of you for my own edification necessarily. I'm paying to put it in front of you because I think that when you see it or when you hear it, you're going to like it. Yeah. 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 It's, it's very much so. Um, I think, you know, cr- content creators want to share and, that's it's it's like the necessary evil of the day <laughs> yeah to, to push yep. it forward that that and clickbait it's the two things that we just have to <laughs> swallow our pride on absolutely well what do you think like moving forward um with ambient notes and what what do you want to accomplish that's on the horizon maybe some some things that you would like to you know navigate it towards yeah that's a good question i uh i don't know i've I have I, I always have half a dozen projects happening at any given time and with usually with no notion of how to brand them, whether it's an ambient notes thing or a Mark Johnston thing or something else. Like I've got a single coming out soon that I'm not gonna promote in any way, shape or form because it's not done yet. And also I'm not even sure if it's gonna be like a Mark Johnston release or like a band name release or anything like that. And uh same thing with the podcast, like you know, I, I grew this audience on the internet and, and all this stuff. And then I'm about to like drop a podcast and it's going to really connect with my fan base because it's a history podcast. Sweet. (laughs) (laughs) But, uh, um, I just, I think that, I think that especially with the, with the ambient notes page, there's a, it's, it, that page is really interesting to me because I, I remember when I was first starting out, even when I was still with my old band and I made a couple of like 
music video y live performance thing for them or for for us I should say at the time. Uh I remember the response I got from people online was pretty good and then Ambient Notes picked up one of those posts and shared it and it was a huge boost for us. It was like the biggest piece of exposure that we got and it really kind of was encouraging and got a lot of positive attention towards us and all these really cool things. And when I when I came on years later to kind of start helping manage that page and everything, uh, I kind of was brought on for a combination of making content specifically for it, as well as helping curate some of the, the features and stuff that, that page has been known for for so long. And uh, and and for a while, I was mostly just making content for that page. And then I found I found a band uh, on that page that. Or but just through the through the tags on that page, uh, this band I don't know how to pronounce their name. It's like Vodlau or something like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, kind of in, two piece instrumental rock band, um, but they had a music video that was just the song was incredible and it was well shot, and it was it's seriously one of the most impressive pieces of music I've seen on Instagram in a long time, and I got really excited about it and I was like, okay, um, I got to share this on the page right now, and I downloaded it, and I reposted it, and I wrote this like long-winded rambly art like like piece about how much i appreciated it and how much it kind of reminds me of like why it's important for curation pages like this to exist and all that and and i watched their like follower count double over the next 24 hours and i saw just dozens of great comments about this this band and all this stuff and and it was really a moment of going like okay I have plans for ambient notes. I have plans on how I want to grow and how I want to branch it and everything. But moments like that remind me that like at its core and especially on Instagram, like it just needs to be a curation page. It just needs to be a place where people who are making really, really killer high quality stuff can be given access to an audience that they otherwise would have no chance of finding. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It meant a lot to me when it would happen to me in the early days and and I felt a very kind of moment of poetic, I don't know, if there's a word that blends irony and justice, uh, to being able to give that to somebody else. And it really kind of made me go, this is why I like this platform. This is why I yeah. like that pages like this exist. This is why, and I'm, I'm going to throw some shade here, and I'm sorry to anybody who might run one of these pages that listens to this podcast, but this is why it's important for pages like this to exist over the 473rd pedal board reposter page. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I don't know. I, uh, I don't know. I like, I like that. I like the, 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 there's, there's, there's really positive pockets of, of gear internet culture. And there's some, there's some not positive ones, but there's some really good positive ones. And I like, I like trying to help be a, a, a positive influence on those those areas well and that's the word you said influence that sometimes that's a negative connotation with with ig and um the social media thing but but really being a social media influencer um it, it, it can do positive things yeah absolutely it's it can be used yeah it gets used for you know people who get an advanced copy of a pedal and a copy of a pedal, an advanced pedal and do a review and a demo and talk about how much they love it and try to push it to people and everything. But it goes, like you said, it goes so much more than it goes so much farther than that. Like guys who are influencers, guys and girls who are influencers in this industry, they, they have a, they have a page that helps push sales like that. They also might have like Facebook pages where like, hundreds and hundreds of guitar players like gather to like talk about this subculture where they have like a lot of sway over how the conversation goes. Uh, Like that influence extends all the way to the way that we have conversations about things like that steel Panther pedal from a few months ago. Yes. Like not just whether or not people buy it, but like how, how it should be looked at and how it affects perceptions of representation in the industry and those are much more important avenues of influence than than just whether or not you should buy that new uh filter sweepy fuzz from walrus right right yeah i mean it it's um like i said it's it's having those who rise to the top 
having a voice and uh, it's the decision to make, use it for good or for worse, you know? And, Absolutely. Um, and the, in this community, I think it's more important than anything is to, to be positive and to, um, to keep at the core of this is a cool thing. I want everybody to see it. Yeah. Yeah. And to go, I also, I, 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 this is a cool thing and I want people to see it. And like, I want people to want to be a part of this too, mm -hmm. because getting people engaged in this is not just good for me, but it's good for the, every, the structure around what we do and, and finding ways to engage other people and to make them feel like they also have an influence on this and a voice on this and all that stuff. Because like I said, when we were talking about kind of me building my like Instagram presence early on, I really attribute the vast majority of it to just kind of the luck of the draw on the way that engagement works on the internet. And, and there's no reason for it to be me over any number of the like much better musicians than I am. So as long as I've got it, I might as well try to go, Hey, like, this is an in, this is this is a culture that made me feel very very welcomed and very very appreciated back when I had no metrics to prove that I should be here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's that's a that's a really cool. Um, kind of come for full circle there. Well, yeah, yeah, talking about we we've talked a lot about Nam and Chris Cross. It I thought it'd be appropriate to um, kind of mention, I know every time that I um, I went to the back of Naom and went by like the uh, boutique pedal builders uh, booth, um, nine times out of 10, like you were there hanging out, looking at pedals. Is, is that, <laughs> is that where you spent the majority of your time? <laughs> um, <laughs> what, what did you, uh, what did you see at Naom and, and kind of your experience there? Yeah, yeah. I um I hang out there for for two re three I'm going to say three reasons. One, summer name is tiny, man. There is not a lot mm -hmm. there. I'm used to winter nam. This is my first summer nam and and so I heard, I knew it was smaller, but I figured it was like half the size. And for those of you listening at home, winter nam is I think seven times the size of summer nam. It is it is an order of magnitude. It is crazy. Yeah. But so, like, companies I would have loved to have gone and checked out while I was there, had they been there, would have been companies like Universal Audio, uh, uh, KRK, Roland, like, uh, comp or, or I would have spent half a day just in the, uh, in the modular synth realm. Um, but none of that stuff is present at Summer NAM, and so, uh, so I kind of ran out of other stuff other than the boutique world to hang out at. Um, the two much more prevalent reasons I was constantly over there were, uh, one, there was just, there was, I mean, especially on those mixed boards, uh, that, um, that Grant from Big Year curated, like that, those boards had so much stuff going on that I was like, okay, like half these companies I've heard of, but I've never had the chance to like get anywhere near one of their gear, one of their pedals. And so I really wanted to make sure that I kind of got some time with stuff that I knew I wouldn't be able to see until my next NAM showing of some kind. Uh, but the other one is just like, that's just, that's where the people I know are like, like through, through all of the weird social media oddities and everything. Like I've, I've, I've gotten to become really like good friends with a lot of these people. And like, if I'm going to be in Nashville, I'm going to hang out with like the people I consider friends. And all of them are right there. Guys like Dan from old blood and, uh, Matt Hoops, who who uh, owns 1981, and I have become really good friends over the last year, and so I just kind of like, I just kind of exist near him anytime he's around. Because he's a very, you've 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 met Matt, right? Uh, I've just he's, crossed paths with him. I don't think I've had okay. a, yeah actually met him. He's he has a very calming presence, and I think that might be because he barely speaks over a whisper under any circumstances. Wow. But uh, but he's just he's a very he's a, he's a great dude. And he's super calming, and so I have a lot of social anxiety, especially in crowds. And so hanging out with a guy like that really helps assuage some of my, some of my nerves. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I just, it's just, that's just, yeah, like I said, that's where, that's where everyone I know is. So that's, that's where you're going to find me. 
Yeah. Well, it, it was a really, really cool place. And um, I, good grief. I wish I could actually have spent time playing every one of those pedals. And you just can't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's so hard. Like, it, it wasn't until day three that I even got a chance to touch things like the... Um, Oh man, what's the VHS delay? Um, you you know which one I'm talking about, right? Yeah, yeah, Demodash. Yeah, Demodash. Yeah, like it was the third day that I finally got a chance to touch that one, and it was that third day that I finally got a chance to play the Whirly Bird too. And it's it's like you think that two full days there would have been enough time, but somehow it just never is. Mm-mm. Yeah, and and to mention just around the corner from the back of that, there was another. Um, the, like the deli <laughs> back there with all those puddles as well. And, uh, oh yeah. Over, is that, are you talking about over where like uh red Panda and uh, yeah. three degrees audio was and everything? Yeah. Yeah. It was um, just a whole bunch of stuff over there. There was actually some of the builders had like stuff at both. So, which I thought was neat. Um, yeah. Yeah. Some of them had some stuff kind of represented in the mixed boards, right? Yeah. That's awesome. So very, very, very cool seeing I think it's really cool seeing Naom kind of take, like, with this little niche market. It's like, you know, no, none of those companies are huge mega powerhouses, but like they're bonding together, banding together to, to um, you know, have a presence there, which is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Like most, I, I mean, the vast majority of those companies, especially on the mixed boards, especially over there, are like, yeah, one or two person operations. And they're making great stuff like a wall pedals, uh, big ear, like these guys are just making like really phenomenal stuff. And, and, but you're, you're absolutely right. Like by themselves, very few of them could afford to have any presence there, but they've, there's such a good collaborative subculture that we're in that they're able to get this huge piece of real estate in the, in the convention hall just for the express purpose of this stuff, which is really cool. Yeah. This it's one of the most rad things going on and, and you know, it it'd be interesting to see how that takes shape through the years. Cause I think this is my third yeah, it was my third summer now. And I remember like the first one kinda of being like everybody talking about that starting to take shape and it has now and it's kinda of full swing. So um and then winter now too, like I saw a lot of that popping up. Like the deli had their thing, there was another one that was kinda of doing the same thing further away um it's it's a really cool place right now and you know guitar builders like some of the small guitar builders may um partner with another booth and kind of put some there and th- same thing with amps and it's just it's really collaborative and I, I love to see that happening yeah yeah i totally agree i think gosh i don't i don't know how much of this is speaking out of out of school and everything but uh i think i think i heard that it was like I mean, it depends on pedal enclosure size and everything, but I, I, I want to say that I, it was like, what, like 80 to a hundred bucks to get a pedal onto one of those like mixed boards. If you wanted to, like, it's such a, it's such an accessible thing for somebody who's like, like you said, like just doesn't have that, that autonomy and that power on their own. And the fact that like somebody who doesn't need to be creating that is like taking the time to facilitate that is really exciting. Yeah. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree yeah. more. I love, I love that. I love that the weird subculture that we are in, and it's even funnier to see it at at Winter Nam when all of a sudden a bunch of those companies break out into these like monstrous booths, like the like the uh, the JHS and the and the Keeleys and the and the Chase Blisses during win, during Winter Nam, but then to see them kind of fold back into these like cool collaborative areas during summer, I think is just a very cool thing. Yeah, yeah, it, it is. It's very much so, and um, I, I I like summer now because it's more chill it's more laid back you can have a conversation on the floor <laughs> and, oh, yeah. yeah what's her name is like painful to be inside it is it is an oppressive volume yeah yeah i i mean i felt like there was one place towards the back um that literally sounded like i was standing on the tarmac of like a lax or something <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. It, yeah. L- LA, LA is not a good place. <laughs> Just so, in general, Anaheim, Anaheim is a, is an urban wasteland. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very interesting place to me. Uh, I haven't quite come to terms with what I think about it 
but I mean, it's it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm so glad to have had you on the the, the show. Um, if you don't mind, I'm gonna kind of spring this on you, but yeah, go the, for it. The podcast you were talking about is that something you can kind of this should be hitting maybe closer to when um, that's coming out. Do you want to pull, put a plug for that? Sure, sure. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a I have a podcast that I mean, fingers crossed, is out by the time uh, this this comes out. I've been I've been I've been trying to like refresh my email all day, hoping it's hoping the like <laughs> announcement will come through. But uh, yeah, it's called Footnotes, a history podcast, and uh, it's just my one of my best friends in second grade and I, uh, who have both been big history buffs our whole lives. Uh, picking kind of liner note moments from history. Uh, so our first three episodes are on a guy named William Walker, who's a very interesting person because you may know the name, but he was a um, he was a uh, he was a like lawyer turned doctor turned newspaper uh, like distrib- distribution owner who traveled from Auburn, California to Nicaragua with 20 mercenaries where he overthrew the Nicaraguan government and tried to establish a new American slave state. Wow. It is a bizarre, insane story that involves him getting into a, a river landscape or a river, a river, uh, like waterway control feud with, uh, Vanderbilt, the billionaire. Mm-hmm. It's, it's chaos. It's just like a weird, a weird story, but, we're just kind of taking small moments from history that are like really noteworthy, but not super kind of well researched and well known and just doing like multi episode deep dives on them. Uh, but yeah. So it's, it's called footnotes. If, uh, if people are into that kind of thing, there'll, they'll, they'll, they'll be links to it on all of my socials once it comes out. So yeah, it'll well, be hopefully easy to find. Well, feel free to share that in here. Um, I would love to check that out. I'm, I'm, Thanks, I'm man. super into that kind of nerd out stuff. So, uh, really cool. Now, um, ambient notes can just be found on Instagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just at ambient notes on Instagram. Okay. You'll know it when you see it. And then they can also find you on Instagram as well, your personal page. And that's kind of where I got connected with you. Um, yeah, originally. yeah. So, um, well, cool. I, I'm so glad to to finally, you know, kind of get some backstory on on all that. And it was great to meet you out of now, but really enjoyed having this conversation with you and and just getting to know you a little bit better yeah thank you very much and i really appreciate you having me and also we didn't discuss this ahead of time or anything i just want to throw out that i got a chance to play the whirly bird at nam for the first time and uh dude it's really good we hadn't we i hadn't played it when you and i talked at the strange joy thing uh-huh. but i made my way over to it like two days later or whatever and it sounds stupid stupid good well, thank you. Yeah, yeah. I'm. Um, I've been very excited about it. And it's been. It's been a really cool thing to, like we were talking about, collaborate, and uh, it's. It's just been really fun. That's awesome. That's super cool. Well, thank you so much, and and listeners, go check those out. And uh, should be should be live soon. And uh, go go check out his his um his Instagram page, and uh, he does some really cool things. So, thanks again, Mark. Thank you for having me. Have a good one.